Support for I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere comes from MX Publishing, with the largest catalog of new Sherlock Holmes books in the world. New novels, biographies, graphic novels, and short story collections about Sherlock Holmes. Find them at mxpublishing.com. And by the Wes Express, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wesexpress.com. And from listeners like you, who support us through Patreon. Bonus material, thank you gifts, and more await at patreon.com slash I Hear of Sherlock. Andrew Lysette's latest book, The Worlds of Sherlock Holmes, has just hit bookshelves. And he's already getting feedback. I've had comments on it, and they all sort of say, what a wonderful production. I'm still waiting for people to say, you know, the, the, the words are good too, but... <laughs> <laughs> The interesting part about this new book is going to be hearing from Andrew how he, as a Conan Doyle biographer, brought a new and different approach to this kind of survey material for the world of Sherlock Holmes. I'm a biographer of Conan Doyle. I'm not a sort of um, paid-up Sherlockian. I'm doing my best to kind of get up to speed, <laughs> but, um, you know, what I've tried to do in this book um, that we're referring to is try to put together some of the Sherlockian background with some of the Doylean background. And, um, you know, I, I, hope, I hope that works because sometimes Conan Doyle has been left out of the picture, as I'm sure you know, you know within the Sherlockian world, um, you know, there's been the great game and you know, or the, the game uh, of sort of considering Dr. Watson to be the, the biographer of, of Holmes. Um, and so, you know, the actual ultimate creator of it, you know, has sometimes been forgotten. You know, people are beginning to incorporate Conan Doyle back into the picture and sort of finding him uh, an interesting character in his own right and part of the Sherlockian story. So let's get on with the story that Andrew has to tell us here. I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, Episode 274, The Worlds of Sherlock Holmes. I hear of Sherlock everywhere since you became a strong man. In a world where it's always 1895, it's... I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, a podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. You're Holmes the meddler, Holmes the busybody, Holmes the Scotland Yard jack in office. (laughs) The game's afoot as we interview authors, editors, creators, and other prominent Sherlockians on various aspects of the great detective in popular culture. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Burt Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! I'm Bill Curtis. This is I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Now, here are your hosts, Scott Monty and Bert Walder. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you very you much, folks. Bill Curtis. Uh, it is great to be back here on I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees where it's always 1895. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Walder. And Bert, how are things in your world today? How in my world, my world, had we but world enough in time, this coyness lady were no crime. We would sit down and think which way to walk and pass our long love's day. Well, so there you are. Well done. Uh, the I think world that's, is that's uh, Andrew. I think that's Marvel. Andrew Marvel. Andrew Marvel. Hmm. Yeah, I think so. Had we well, but world sometimes... enough in time. Oh, interesting. Wow, the world is too much for us, I think. Getting and spending, world is we too lay much waste yet. our powers. That is 
a little we see in nature that is ours. Yeah. They've given our hearts away a sordid boon. Yeah. Wow. So we need to have a new podcast, Poetry Trading. <laughs> oh, by your host, Wordsworth. <laughs> Ah, yeah, that is... Well, you know what they say about words worth. Words are worth what you pay for. (laughs) Oh, boy. Well, we better hurry up and get into this show because people are... People are busy with their time. They're paying for this. Turning off all across the country and the world. Yes. Enough of this, they say. Today's interview is... uh, It's going to be a a real banger. Uh, We have Andrew Lysette with us. And we should share this little secret with our listeners no we shouldn't yeah i feel like we have to come clean no back in 2007 2008 andrew lysette wrote a biography of conan doyle Mm. and we thought it was a really well done biography so well that we invited andrew to be on the show so we interviewed him believe it or not we did and then well let's just say there was a hard drive (laughs) crash involved and the files were never recovered yeah unrecoverable sadly we never got to air that interview it is it is like the james fillimore of podcast episodes not only did we never get to air it we never get to heard it we We didn't get to hear it yeah (laughs) we didn't get to edit it that was it yeah um but someday in some cloud no not even a cloud because if it were in the cloud we could have saved it but in some Mm. uh electronic dump you know, someone will find our equivalent of Watson's tin box and, yeah, uh, and find that it. episode with Andrew Lysette. So the great news is he is here with us today. We were able to save and edit his episode. <laughs> and the book, my goodness, this yeah, book. Yeah, it's a great book. Um, I, we can't say enough good things about it. I mean, it is, uh, it is a, an, a piece of art. It is lovely to hold, lovely to flip through. It is so well written. Uh, the flow, uh, as uh, Andrew takes us through the evolution of Sherlock Holmes in the world and what the world contributed to Sherlock Holmes, it's this is one of those books that every Sherlockian needs to own. And you're going to hear why. So, in the meantime, if you would like to listen to this show ad-free, you can do so by becoming a Patreon supporter. For as little as $1 a month, we give you the shows ad-free, as well as some thank you gifts and other uh, bonus material from time to time. As a matter of fact, if you become a Patreon supporter, you will be able to listen to the conversation as it continues. We had more things to talk about with Andrew that couldn't make the cut for this episode. So it is available to our Patreon supporters. Just go to patreon.com slash I hear of Sherlock. And of course you can get the show notes for this episode, which includes a link to Patreon at ihose.co slash ihose274. All lowercase ihose.co slash ihose274 or simply go to the I hear of Sherlock.com website. And you can sign up for email updates there and poke around and get a copy of the book. We, of course, have a link directly to uh, bookshops so you can order the book and um, enjoy all of the associated content. Andrew Lysette is a biographer, author, and broadcaster. He lectures and speaks at schools, universities, and literary festivals. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature as well as of the Royal Geographical Society and has been a longtime member and leader of the Kipling Society. Born in Stamford, Lincolnshire, Andrew lived in East Africa until he was eight and then in Yorkshire, Dublin, and Sussex. He was educated at Charterhouse and Christ Church, Oxford, where he read modern history and edited Cherwell, the university newspaper. After graduating, he traveled in and began writing about India. Some of his earliest articles appeared in the Illustrated Weekly of India and the Rising Nepal. Since the mid-1990s, he's concentrated on writing non-fiction books, mainly biographies. His Ian Fleming, published in 1995, is considered the definitive life of James Bond's creator. He wrote Rudyard Kipling in 1999, and it drew an enthusiastic response. This was followed by Dylan Thomas, A New Life, in 2003, and Conan Doyle, 
the man who created Sherlock Holmes in 2007. Other books have included Kipling Abroad, an anthology of Rudyard Kipling's travel writing, and Wilkie Collins, A Life of Sensation. And his latest book is The Worlds of Sherlock Holmes, the inspiration behind the world's greatest detective. Andrew Lysette, welcome to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Indeed, we all hear it everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the hope. That is the yeah. hope. Well, uh, we uh, can't wait to speak with you about this this book, The Worlds of Sherlock Holmes, the inspiration behind the world's greatest detective. But why don't we begin at your beginning with Sherlock Holmes? When did you first become aware of Holmes, and how did you encounter him? Well, I mean, I first encountered Sherlock Holmes like most people as, as a child, and, uh, you know, it absorbed... Um, not the whole canon at that stage, but absorbed, you know, some of the, the stories. Some made a particular impression on me. Um, you know, I've always been a great fan of the Hound of the Baskervilles, for example. Um, but really, my sort of uh, engagement with Sherlock Holmes began, um, what are we talking about now as far as years are concerned? But it was a, it was a almost 20 years ago, um, when I decided that I wanted to write a biography of Conan Doyle. Now, you know, that is sort of coming to Sherlock Holmes from, um, you know, a, not exactly the back, but from, you know, a, a side approach, because I'm a, you know, I had been, I am a biographer, and I was interested in the totality of the person that was Arthur Conan Doyle. This was a man who um, created Sherlock Holmes, obviously, that's what he's best known for. But, you know, there was so much more to him. And again, um, perhaps we shall come back to that. But, you know, this, I at that stage, I'd written biographies of um, a number of people. And the, probably the most significant in this context was that I'd written a biograph biography of the uh, British author, the Anglo-Indian author, Rudyard Kipling. Um, mm. By various processes, which I can go into if you want, um, uh, Kipling led me to um, to Conan Doyle, uh, and um, as you probably know, you know the, the two men uh, were sort of were friends. Basically, um, Conan Doyle, after his first flush of success. Uh, visited um, Rudyard Kipling, who was married to an American woman. He visited uh, Kipling in his house in Brattleboro, Vermont. And they played uh, a game of golf, which fascinated me. These two uh, English authors, basically, in America. Um, and so at that stage, uh, I think I've got this right. Um, you know, I'd, I'd written about Kipling and I was sort of became interested in in Conan Doyle and I approached the um the Conan Doyle estate the Conan Doyle family about writing a book and you know they were not um sort of uh against the idea but they sort of they indicated that it wasn't quite the right time and a few years later it, it became clear why it was I mean a few only you know uh, less than a half a dozen years later, it became clear why this was the case, because uh, the um, uh, estate of Conan Doyle put up um, well, the, the, the sort of material in the estate was put up for sale at an auction, a famous auction in Christie's, uh, at Christie's, the auction yeah. house in London. And um, I went along there and was able to absorb a lot of the the material, uh, which was which was great, and then I this was really my first introduction to Sherlockians. Really, um, a lot of the material had been brought by bought by uh, Sherlockians, um, prince not exclusively but principally in the United States, and they were very helpful, very welcoming uh, in sharing that material with me, and I'm. Talking about um, people like uh, Glenn Miranka, 
Costas uh, uh, Rosakis. And of course, you know, that doesn't rule out that, that you know, there was a lot of material uh, which remained here in this country that I'm speaking from, from the United Kingdom, because probably actually the most, the biggest um, purchaser, individual sort of um, purchaser of uh, material at that Conan Doyle sa sale was the British Library, uh, uh, with lots of letters um, written by Conan Doyle to his mother and diaries and, and all sorts of material that actually ended up Thankfully, and I'm, I'm glad that they took the initiative, it ended up at the British Library, which is very fit. Hmm. Well, you've, you know, you've, uh, <laughs> the, you know, the way you describe your connection to Conan Doyle, it's, it's almost as if you're entering a, a swimming pool, you know, at the very, at the very shallow end, and then you get deeper and deeper and deeper, and then suddenly there's this drop. <laughs> and <laughs> and you're surrounded by this community of very active swimmers. Yes, uh, right. <laughs> you know, it, it's really remarkable. And you've, you know, and but there's a background here too. You know, your work over the years with your biography of Kipling in 1999, Dylan Thomas, and you know, lately Wilkie Collins. You know, within the last four or five years. Um, and of course, Ian Fleming. You know, you've written the definitive biography of Ian Fleming. Do you? Um, it's an unfair question, but considering the people that have come under your pen—you know, Kipling and Fleming and Dylan mm. Thomas and Conan Doyle—do you have a sense of commonality about them? What they all might have in common? I mean, other than you, you know, in one way or another, being affected by their time and by the empire and by. Mm. external events uh, do you think um, is there some sort of unifying theme around them that you find particularly attractive about their personalities or their work or their lives or well um you know sort of goes without saying that they're they're writers um but actually taking it a bit further than that um what initially drew me not particularly i can't really say that but drew me you know powerfully to Ian Fleming and to Kipling and to an, to an extent to Conan Doyle uh, was that they were journalists as well as being writers. Now, yes, less, less Conan Doyle in that context. Um, Kipling had worked as a journalist in, in India and all that kind of thing. Um, but, um, you know, I'd before taking to writing biographies, I had been a journalist and I traveled around and um, done all sorts of bits of journalism in uh, different parts of the world. I'd written one of my books, uh, actually I wrote it with somebody, was um, a, a sort of biography, a history of Gaddafi, the Libyan leader. Uh, and um, so at a certain stage in my life, I decided that I, you know, I wasn't going to be sort of you know, prancing up on the barricades in um, Iraq, uh, aged 45, 50, you know, that, that was for younger people. And, uh, um, you know, sort of began to channel my energies, which in a way suited me better for my personality, actually. I began to channel my energies into um, writing biographies, which kind of, as I say, really, you know, really was... You know, turned out to be my thing. I like research. I like going into libraries. I like finding out about things. Um, you know, that process of research is such fun. Um, much better than writing, of course. Uh, <laughs> but um, so, you know, I've, and also being, you know, I suppose a kind of um, uh, quite... Um, not solitary is not exactly the, the the word, but you know, I mean, I, I, I sort of keep my own company, if you like, and so the 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 lifestyle of um, uh, a, a, a biographer, you know, working on his own, um, but obviously with the help. And here, this is the the I guess the important thing that you know, and you've alluded to it that there is a whole community out there to sort of. Um, uh, 
get in touch with. And, uh, you know, I couldn't have done any of these books. And, you know, this applies as, as much to uh, Conan Doyle and indeed to the, the latest book, um, the, the Worlds of Sherlock Holmes. I couldn't have done it without the support of uh, so many people. Um, well, that sort of goes without saying, but, um, uh, you know, that has come um, has come home to me um, very much. Uh, and, um, you know, I'm very grateful to them. Hmm. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's clear that, that your background and your sense of the world and your explorations of things, the things, you know, that you've written your early days as a journalist have all come together in the worlds of Sherlock Holmes because what makes it really distinctive, at least I can say this as a reader, is that it's just a remarkable synthesis. It's the only book, it's, you know, the text that you've come up with here is a magnificent synthesis of, and and effortless, it just seems effortless in your prose, the synthesis between the political undercurrents, the, the empire, the world of the empire, the world of Conan Doyle, and then the world of the canon and of Sherlock Holmes and in his own particular evolution, his series of cases, you know, as, as it's, it's just brilliantly organized. And I'm, I'm, you know, just stunned at what did it take? How, how did you come up with the structure here? Because what you have is a Sherlockian sense of place, Britain in the wider world. You've got a wonderful section on science You've got the stage and screen representations, um, and much, much, much more. And and uh, you know the whole thing reads like a like a marvelous conversation. Um, wow. <laughs> with someone about. Uh, but how did you come up with the the structure and the organization of it? We haven't even gotten to the design and the illustrations. But how did you come up right. with the organization of it as a text? Well, thank you very very much because um, you know that kind of makes my day really i have to tell you because um you know i'm it's only just come out and um you know i'm still awaiting uh sort of verdicts on it um i think it is a a very wonderful design and we can get onto that but you know there there there's my words um it's a curious hybrid actually funny enough and uh, it's it's a it's a sort of it's not a biography so it's different from what I've normally done. It's it's um it's it is a synthesis, and you're you're absolutely right. But it it's also an illustrated book. Um, I've already discovered actually, and um, this is not to sort of put it down. It's rather to you know say that um, this is this is a fact. It's it's quite a difficult book for uh, booksellers to kind of. Um, categorize uh, because as I say it's not it's not sort of you know you can't put it sort of in um, general non-fiction well you can I suppose but um, you know it's it's a it's a it's an illustrated book with what I like to think is some pretty good text and I hope that the text doesn't get lost and from what you said uh, you certainly appreciate it and I'm very grateful to you um, you asked I think about you know so how I um, yeah. Sort of arrived at this this structure. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. Right. Okay. So, how did I arrive at this structure? Well, I mean, the the first thing that I was really thinking about, and one sort of feature of my background that you haven't a light you haven't mentioned, you may may know, um, is that basically I I studied. Um, history and um, that was my sort of undergraduate uh, um, area of study and I've, I've always sort of kept that up and you know I'm now a fellow of the Royal Historical Society and things like that so you know history has re remained an important uh, factor in important area in my life uh, you know it's in a way that's what one is always doing in, as a journalist, you know, writing the first draft of history, blah, blah, blah. But um, so I wanted to sort of use my historical knowledge, uh, my historical, not so much knowledge, but my historical kind of way of thinking um, to get into particular areas of Sherlock Holmes. And 
what I particularly wanted to look at was, you know, I came up with this phrase about, um, I, I think it, it, may, it may be there in, in some of the material that you've got there about um, Sherlock Holmes was, was about questing. Uh, and, you know, this word questing came up in things that I wrote early on. And wh what I meant about that was that he was about finding out about the world, finding out about, uh, well, in his case, finding out about details in, in cases that were presented to him. Um, but looking at it uh, in a sort of slightly wider sense, um, he and indeed his his um, his creator, if I'm allowed to use it that way, uh, Conan Doyle, you know, they had a, a, a sense of the world. Now here, you know, you'll find that my book kind of moves between Sherlock Holmes and Conan Doyle um, quite freely in, in some ways in, in sort of interpreting things. And I came to the conclusion that, um, you know, a lot of the, you know, you can sort of talk about the individual cases and stuff like that, but there was sort of various themes in uh, Sherlock Holmes's um, life and, and working life. And, you know, I wanted to explore them in sort of historical way. And that is how I managed to, I sort of arrived at the, um, the, the structure for the book. Um, you know, I talk first particularly after a sort of introduction I talk about the his um, his sense of place now obviously uh, that was you know very important as far as Sherlock Holmes was concerned you know Sherlock Holmes was was based there in in Baker Street and his world uh, kind of emanated out of that so I explored the various places associated with um, Sherlock Holmes, but you know that has been done by other people. I'm, I, I, I know. You know, I did it. That's just a chapter in in my book. Uh, I talked about you know the way that uh, he and behind him Conan Doyle uh, were re sort of responsible for this vision of London that you get in the stories. You know, which goes from, you know, obviously from Baker Street through. Um, uh, you know, chases up um, uh, um, the River Thames in um, the sign of four, and then you get sort of uh, events happening in the, the East End of London. And then you get uh, Sherlock Holmes moving out into the, the countryside and, um, you know, taking the train, you know, the transportation systems I, I consider to be quite important initially in uh, London, because you've got the underground, which uh, plays a role in um, certain of the stories. And, uh, you you know, this was just coming into uh, um, use uh, when Sherlock Holmes uh, set up in, in London and when Conan Doyle was coming to London. So there's, there's sort of overlap between them. So moving on from the sense of place, and we'll just go through a couple of other things, uh, you know, I wanted to explore something of the I, the sort of political background to to Sherlock Holmes, and here I was again somewhat influenced by Conan Doyle, his begetter, um, in that you know I was aware that uh, Conan Doyle came from basically an Irish background. He was born in Scotland. But his both his grandparents were Irish, and then he he sort of made himself into an Englishman. But um, you know, we we'll leave that on one side. Um, I think that the Irish background to Conan Doyle was was pretty significant in his life because it, you know, that I explain in the book how there was this a sort of world of um, Fenianism, which was sort of rep Irish republican um, activism that he, from an early age, sort of took against. He found it uh, unproductive and destructive. And so you get uh, the sense of the, um, the, the Fenians, the 
the scourers, the, 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 the people who crop up in, in the stories sort of being um, disruptive. And the point really there is that Conan Doyle was sort of placed his faith, uh, for want of a better word, uh, very much in the ordered world that came with the empire. And he, you know, I'm talking there about the, the British Empire, um, you know, he became, he was actually, I mean, he wasn't a, a sort of total reactionary by any means. And that's actually one of the things that make him an interesting character. And he, this sort of takes, um, you know, is, is, is uh, replicated in, in Sherlock Holmes. But uh, so Conan Doyle himself, you know, kind of got involved in, in uh, all sorts of liberal causes such as you know he was president of the divorce law reform association and things like that he fought against uh, slavery in the congo um and of course he took up cases like the um the Adelgi case that he kind of made his own um but he did believe in the beneficial effect effects of the the british empire and you know, he took it even further than that. He he was believed in a sort of Anglo-American federation. Um, and there's that famous quotation, which I, I can't quite remember at the moment, about how um, he's uh, uh, somebody believes in the quartering of the Union Jack with the Stars and Stripes or something like that in, 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 in the, um, one of the stories. And... Uh, um, so, um, you know, his affiliation with the, the United States is in, an important factor. And there I'm talking about Conan Doyle, but also about Sherlock Holmes. Um, and I mean, you could take it further. I'm not actually sure that I quite make this point in the book, but it's just sort of, it's, it's inherent there is that, uh, in his desire for, sort of order and one does, mustn't sort of over overplay that but you know he was he he um he created a character in Sherlock Holmes you know who was who created um order out of disorder uh and you know you can view that from all sorts of angles but uh you know obviously one of the attractions of uh, Sherlock Holmes uh, for his readers at the time particularly was that you know Sherlock Holmes in a t at a time when the British and you know this is again is sort of something that I, I kind of refer to the, the the British Empire was sort of beginning to crack up of, around the, the end of the, the 19th century there was there was some other people on the block there was Germany um, looking you know, covetously at, at um, colonies, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, the, in uh, Conan Doyle's readers and, you know, the readers of, of Sherlock Holmes, they wanted some sense of continuity uh, and, of course, excitement. You know, this, I mean, in my litany of things that I was referring to then, you know, you could also point to the way that, you know, there appeared to be quite a lot of crime uh, in the, the the last decade of, of the, the 19th century. You've got the um, uh, Jack the Ripper and all that kind of thing in, in London. And this is where uh, Sherlock Holmes came and he seemed to give a sense that things could be worked out. He used his rational sense. Now, the, again, this... Uh, kind of plays into another side of what I was trying I have I was trying to do I you know I I did in my book which was to explore the way that Conan Doyle and well actually particularly in this sense Sherlock Holmes drew on the existing sort of science of his day and made them into his the tools of his trade. Now I can go into that a bit more if you want, but you know that was all uh, part of this uh, process of Conan Doyle stroke Sherlock Holmes because 
in a, in, a, in a way, they're sort of synonymous in my book. Not exactly. I mean, I make the distinction between them. But, uh, you know, they were both about the same thing, about using the advances in the world, exploring the advances in the world, using them, you know, for the, the good of humanity. Like that's what Sherlock Holmes was doing. He was drawing on uh, scientific advances in uh, criminology and detective work to um, to kind of you know come to solutions of his cases, um, and you know this is what both Sherlock Holmes and his creator were doing in their lives, if you like. Um, so I'll leave it at that for the time being. <laughs> come back with something else. Yeah, well, I think that really encapsulates a lot of the phenomenon that you know we there's this fluidity between uh storytelling and reality and it 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 seems to have occurred at the right time you know you have conan doyle who was initially a man of science became a wonderful storyteller and those two elements of his personality were perfectly fused in the sherlock holmes stories and you have Conan Doyle and Holmes borrowing on real world advances and at the same time in the fanciful world of Sherlock Holmes with his monographs and his uh, advances in the field of detection that eventually influenced the way the real world evolved so there's this wonderful back and forth this fluidity of movement between story and reality to the point where at, at a certain juncture fans of the stories would write to Sherlock Holmes thinking he was a real person. And I don't know if there's any other example in literary history where someone has been so successful that they've confused the public hmm. with a real person. Is there anything? Well, I, I'm just interested in your commentary on that evolution of life imitating art and art imitating life. Well, I think you've put it incredibly well, so thank you very much. I mean, you know, can I use that? <laughs> uh, um, but yes, of course, of course, you're right. Um, is there any instance of uh, that um, being done? Well, in a, I mean, I'm going to explore that from a slightly different angle, if you like. Uh, you know, Sherlock Holmes stroke Conan Doyle, they, they were very much of their time. You know, this was... Uh, an era when um, uh, sort of modernity was 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 becoming real. That's not very well put, but you know this was the, the time when the motor car was was just coming into uh, use. Uh, this was a time when you know the telephone. This was also the time when you are beginning to get the um, the motion picture. And as is quite well known, Conan Doyle was very interested in photography. And so that's sort of a bit of a sideline. You know, one of his early hobbies was photography and he wrote about it um, interestingly. But um, so you get uh, Sherlock Holmes beginning to be portrayed on film. Well, first of all, interestingly, on stage. Uh, through William Gillette, you know, who is a very important player in this in this uh, story. But then you get uh, Sherlock Holmes on film. Um, you know, this obviously doesn't really kind of get moving until the the, the twenties. I think it's true to say. Um, you know, with the Stoll films, and you know, the, then you get the Basil Rathbone and all that. But it was a process that was beginning to happen. And I suppose what I'm trying to say is that, again, you know, not forgetting the very important influence of the theatre and Gillette, you know, you get um, uh, Sherlock Holmes sort of just having a, a much wider constituency than just the stories in the Strand magazine or Collier's. Uh, you get um, people sort of seeing him on stage and sort of seeing his image and relating to that. And they begin to incorporate his personality uh, much more kind of comprehensively, I think it's true to say. 
uh, than might have been just if he'd been on the page. And consequently, you get this phenomenon which you have referred to, of sort of people writing into uh, Baker Street. You get um, you you get the 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 people beginning to write uh, stories. You know, f- fanfic. Uh, you get that from a, a pretty early age, um, and you know this particularly took hold during the. Um, I suppose, you know, the, the, the hiatus and when Sherlock Holmes was out of, the, out of play uh, from about, what was it, um, 1893 to 1901. Uh, and, um, you know, you get people wanting to introduce uh, ersatz Holmeses. You know, you get other authors creating um, Sherlock Holmes type fiction including his own brother-in-law, um, E.W. Horner. Uh, but you get also um, that this is the era when you first get that flurry of, you know, just the ordinary people writing uh, their own Sherlock Holmes stories. And, you know, this continues uh, and, until this day. Now, what are, what are we now? We're over a century later. Is that right? Um, and, uh, you know, we've got, all sorts of uh, things on the internet of people imitating Sherlock Holmes, trying to create Sherlock Holmes. It's an extraordinary phenomenon. And that's actually a, a chapter of mine to, to look at that, that legacy as, and, you know, how that, how that came about and, you know, what, it, what exactly is, is, is there. Yeah. It's really remarkable that this could have occurred at the time. And, and obviously the confluence of, events and the way, as you say, science and just the world was advancing. Do you think that this could have been possible in any other era? <laughs> um, well, I've tried to explain there that, that, you know, it was very much a phenomenon of its particular time. Uh, and, you know, various things coming together communications being an important factor. So possibly not, is the answer to your question. I'm not ruling out, you know, that there couldn't have been something like that, you know, in the, I don't know, Elizabethan times, but I doubt it because it was very much a phenomenon of its times. And, you know, I'll, I'll stick with that. I'll, you know, happy, mm. happy to, to stick with that. <laughs> Stick with us. We'll be back after this brief word from our sponsor. Well, it is autumn and the autumnal gales have blown in yet more works from Sherlockian authors at MX Publishing. New works include books like The Medical Casebook of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson by Nick Howell, A Study in Statecraft by Orlando Pearson, and Sherlock Holmes, The Devil's Disciples by Richard T. Ryan. There are literally dozens upon dozens of books to choose from that were released in 2023 alone. And if you take a look at all of the new books that are coming, they are laid out by week, even in some case by the day, in the new arrivals at MX Publishing. Whether it's scholarship, pastiche, or other survey work, your need will be answered in the Sherlockian book world at mxpublishing.com. Make sure you check them out today and tell them IHO sent you. In terms of the reality of Sherlock Holmes, one of the things that boosted that were the illustrations in the Strand by Sidney Paget and in the States by Frederick Dorr Steele, who presented Holmes, you know, in such a mm. um, realistic manner. And that's a good path to get to the design of this book and mm. to the illustration. And, um, you know, it's illustration is such an important part of storytelling. And one of the particularly unique and notable things about this book is the wonderful way the illustrations 
amplify and comp. You know, sometimes when you're in a text and you're, oh, let's say you're, there's a mention in a text of a, of a ship, you know, um, a less informed designer will, will put in the right column a photograph of a ship, which is, you know, I suppose interesting. But, but there's so much more going on here in the way illustration is practiced in the layout and the design of this book, the selection of the illustrations, their frequency, um, the page layout. How did, how did, it, it's, it really is, it is unique. And of course, it comes from, um, you know, your publisher and the design group. Can you talk a little bit about how the look and the illustrations and the assembly of the book um, was managed? I'd be delighted to because it is very significant. And um, it's interesting for me because, as I've said, you know, I came from a sort of biography background. And, you know, this is uh, essentially a very nice, it's a kind of an illustrated book. I try and sort of steer away from actually saying that because, you know, I, I like to think there's the the contents are pretty imp- the, the words are pretty important too but the publisher Francis Lincoln is part of a an international group that um, publishing group called Quarto um, I don't know if they're known in the United States but um, they are they do have you know arms in in America and Francis Lincoln uh, is a part of them that has a reputation for, for producing, uh, you know, excellent, well-designed, um, illustrated books. And uh, it, um, the name Francis Lincoln is, refers to uh, a lady who sort of set up this particular um, publishing house um, and sort of specializing in that. And unfortunately she died. I never, I've never met her. She sort of, she was a bit of a legend when I was just getting involved in um, writing books, and she was sort of known to be top of top of her trade. Anyway, this Francis Lincoln became part of the the Quarto Group, but maintained, you know, her tradition of excellence, if you like. And you know, to get down to the actual design of this book, my book, The Worlds of Sherlock Holmes. Um, it was a sort of collaborative effort between me making suggestions and the sort of couple of editors I dealt with, one sort of, you know, an editor and one sort of managing editor at Francis Lincoln. Uh, and, you know, sort of arriving a bit sort of slightly ad hoc way, but, you know, with a, a certain uh, element of, you know, well, there were a lot of thought went into it at the actual images that were used uh, in in the story, in the in the text. Um, but you actually refer also, and this is a very important part of it, which the the illustrations which were commissioned uh, from um, uh, a sort of contemporary artist, contemporary illustrator. And these, I think, is actually what you're referring to. These are the ones that sort of uh, illustrate um, various chapters and they, they kind of, they're supposed to encapsulate that. And of course, also included in this is the, the marvelous uh, illustration drawing that uh, is on the, f- the front page, on the, on the, on the cover, uh, shows Charlotte Holmes sort of sitting, brooding. Uh, you know, it's, it's not the typical image of Sherlock Holmes, but it is a, it is a very striking one. And um, it was done by somebody I, you know, I, I kind of, uh, I only really communicated with through my editor. Um, and he was uh, somebody I later learned had been sort of at the, the business of illustrating books for many, many years, somebody called Dave David Hopkins. Uh, and it, there was a, you know, a certain sort of rather s- sad story about that because while I was in the course of um, producing this book and, you know, we're at the editorial stage, uh, it transpired that, a couple of the 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 later 
illustrations. Uh, I was told that the, the, the guy, the artist who was doing it, Dave Hopkins, um, was in hospital and, you know, they, he couldn't actually do the, the last, I think it was last two illustrations. Um, and so somebody in his sort of collective, if you want, of artists could kind of imitate his style and Julie did. And I didn't really think much more about it. And then I kind of, the book came out and, you know, I'm, I'm glad that he gets a, gets a credit. It could have been much bigger, but I, that's it. I then sort of looked, to, I wanted to, to contact the, this artist and thank him for his illustrations. I mean, that was only a week or so ago. And I discovered that sadly he died. Uh, and uh, oh, you know, no. just, he'd gone to hospital, and that was the end. That was the last thing he did. And and indeed, I mean, I don't can't say absolutely, but you know, this the book and the illustration um, on the front uh, would appear to be you know his last work. So I mean, you know, it's very sad for me to to sort of reveal that. Um, you know, I'm trying to kind of make contact with his widow and stuff like that. But, you know, I mean, so, you know, this was um, it's part of the story of, you know, of the the way that this book was, was put together, which is really what you were asking about. But mm. I, I just had to share that with you, if you like. Oh, I'm so glad you did, because that's one of the things that drove me into the book to try to find the name of the artist. Because the style <laughs> it's there of on it. the back cover. Yeah, uh, yeah, but um, you know, you're absolutely right. It's uh, and is the back cover illustration something that was then done by one of his associates? Rather, no, than I think him? I don't. I wouldn't swear to it actually, to be honest. But I think that was done by him. I, I just know that a couple of the the late chapters were probably done by an associate of his. I I, I haven't actually identified which mm. ones. I must do that. Oh, it's yeah, a wonderful. I think that, it's a I think that back story. cover illustration, Bert, is one of the chapter headings. Uh, watching the detectives in the middle oh, of the right. book. Yeah. yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. Right, yeah right. So he would have done that definitely. Yeah. yeah it's wonder. It's wonderful. Wonderful detailed work. I'm sure our friend Frank Cho, who was uh, a great illust, another great illustrator, would uh, greatly appreciate. You know the style and the. Uh, mm. Mm. Uh, it's just. It really is magnificent. It's a great set off for um for the book indeed i mean you know they are sort of stylized images but you know they are recognizable obviously but they are very different from uh the the basically photographs and illustrations inside which you know are traditional you know photographs photographs of pictures etc etc and you know these these have a certain a certain um, quality about them, which is somewhat different. Mm. Well, you know, it's interesting. Over the last century, uh, nearly century and a half, there's been this, uh, I think, appropriate focus on the character Sherlock Holmes. He's been uh, discovered and written about and brought to life in every medium that we have uh, in which to communicate. Mm. And of late, there seems to be more focus on Conan Doyle. Uh, we're, we're moving away from this simply fanciful notion that Conan Doyle was the literary agent. And I know uh, Conan Doyle's sons were not too, well, they were never happy about that. Um, but talk to us a little bit about why you think there's more focus on the creator, Conan Doyle, and uh, discovering more about his life these days. Hmm. It's a very, it's interesting that um, uh, I think um, that you know people just want to sort of expand the the area that they're looking at. You know that the um, uh, concentration on Sherlock Holmes um, and his relationship with Dr. Watson and the game of, you know, what um, can be uh, kind of a, 
read into various stories and you know it's 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 a lot of fun and uh, you know a lot of people have got a lot out of it over over the years um but that has been going on for you know um what is it now you know 80 years i guess or whatever uh and you know there are in the same way that the whole Sherlock Holmes story has been extended into different media, which you referred to, you know, that, um, you know, not just films, but into, you know, comics and et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's just a phenomenon of, of, of our culture, if you like, that, you know, people want to know the, the whole story. And obviously, um, Conan Doyle is part of the story of Sherlock Holmes and the way that um, he, uh, you know, sort of uh, the, the influence that he has on various characters, you know, how you can relate characters back to um, Conan Doyle in one way or another, et cetera, et cetera. And I just... You know, get the impression, as you say, I think I said right at the beginning, you know, that, that there's a, a an attempt now to sort of see Sherlock Holmes together with with Conan Doyle. And interestingly, if I may say this, um, uh, I have been involved in a as historical consultant. Sounds rather fanciful, but that's what I have been on a a new BBC TV series, um, which is just currently being filmed. And, you know, I'm still looking at scripts, et cetera, et cetera. And it is, it's called Conan Doyle versus Sherlock Holmes. Three parts of an hour long. Um, and it's about the kind of relationship that Conan Doyle had with, with Sherlock Holmes. And I, I won't sort of go into it too much at this stage. It's fronted by somebody who's um, quite popular as a his, sort of TV historian here in, in Britain, somebody called Lucy Worsley. I don't know oh, if yeah. you've come across, oh, come sure. across her. Yeah. Uh, she last did something. I mean, she sort of moved from being very much sort of into English history. She seems to have a thing now about detective stories. So she did one about Agatha Christie and, you know, that's, this is in that sort of um, uh, tradition, if you like, the, the thing that she, so this is, you know, quite a significant thing that the BBC has done um, still in production, but it sh should be out by the end of this year. I think, you know, they're sort of for the Christmas market, blah, blah, blah. And it will be shown on PBS in the US uh, next year, I'm reliably told. So um, what was the point I was making? Well, I suppose it, it is that the approach that this significant TV production is taking is to kind of try and... Uh, show the influences of Conan Doyle on Sherlock Holmes and sort of vice versa. So, yeah, very much in, in the way that you have been um, referring to. Well, it's a perfect confluence with your book. So uh, I, I think uh, each will benefit from the other Let's in this hope. Uh, symbiotic yep. relationship, so to speak. Yep, mm. yep indeed. Yep. Wow. Well, um, Andrew Lysette, this is just a, a remarkable book. Uh, we've seen a lot of books written about Sherlock Holmes, about Conan Doyle. And as you say, this doesn't fit in any square category, uh, like biography or such. Uh, but the worlds of Sherlock Holmes, <laughs> it is a must-buy for every Sherlockian and Holmesian that we know. I'm sure it will be... Uh, widely available wherever people get books. Uh, where can people go to find out more about you? <laughs> well, uh, you know, you can find out a bit of me about me if you Google my name on. Um, I, am I, I have a website, and unfortunately, it's. I have to admit, it's somewhat, very much out of date. So, um, you've given me the. You've reminded me that I must um, update that, and then I'll, there'll be more information about that. But you know, basically, anybody who sets about it will find out a about me and b about this book. And you know, it's it's available 
at all good bookstores um, mm. and, you know, other outlets that are well known to us. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Andrew. It's a, it's a pleasure. And the book is just truly remarkable. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate that. That's, that's really delightful to hear that. Thank you so much. You know, when you are a Sherlockian and a reader, you wind up traveling down many paths. You get interested in things. In my case, it's been things like, oh, I don't know, old Bedekers, old travel guides to London in the 19th century. You get interested in the history of the British Empire. I once read the collected speeches of Arthur Balfour because I became interested in Balfour as a character. You get interested in the underground and in tobacco and transportation. And my pal Michael Barton, you know, asked himself once, I wonder where Sherlock Holmes got his scientific equipment. And, you know, he began to research and collect some of that. Well, this is the book that brings all those kind of threads and many more together, you know, and it's, and it's really beautiful. And, and, um, to look at and and beautifully written and the interplay of these things you know in the text is so seamless everything sort of comes at the right point you know andrew will be talking about the british empire and then he'll effortlessly sort of give you a conversation from a case like the naval treaty or the second stain and an illustration on the page will refer to the Triple Alliance, you know, at the right time. I mean, the whole thing is sort of like a Swiss watch. It just, of course, I suppose I have, you know, this sort of mono, almost monomaniacal view about, about you know, the words and the, and the pictures and how everything is working. But, um, I mean, it obviously made a big impression on me. I, I agree. I mean... When I first received the, the copy in the mail, I was just blown away. And again, as you know, I texted you right away, and I said, "Oh, this is this is truly something special." And you know, the, the, okay, the, the the construct of the book, the production quality, the you know, just the layout and everything, it marvelous. But in its entirety, I think it reads like an extended love letter. Mm. to Sherlock Holmes and Conan Doyle and everything that, you know, birthed this entire idea to us. And I wanted to point something out in the postscript that Andrew had written. Uh, He wrote, it's hard to say definitively if he's the world's best known or even best loved fictional character. There's no index to provide a reliable answer, but... The crowds of tourists who regularly congregate on London's Baker Street suggest he is, at least, in the top dozen, along with James Bond, Tarzan, Dracula, Winnie the Pooh, and Alice. From the world of comics and films, you could add Superman and Mickey Mouse. Foreign language characters would give you the Count of Monte Cristo and Tintin, and offering a historical perspective is Robinson Crusoe. And that's before mentioning the remarkable Harry Potter. But give that lad another century or so, and we'll see how he fares. <laughs> so, uh. ultimately, you know, if, if we were to remove ourselves from today's world and transplant ourselves a hundred years hence, I would imagine Sherlock Holmes will still be doing just fine. Thank you very much. The Sherlock Holmes Review is back with articles on Sherlockian film and television, classic canonical scholarship, detective stories, illustrators, collecting, and more. In the latest annual, Curtis Armstrong tells how his love of Sherlock Holmes and acting first came together, how he starred in his first radio series, The Baker Street Theater, while he was still in high school, his encounter with Sherlock Holmes, Hugh Laurie and Lin-Manuel Miranda, when he featured in the TV series House, how Sherlock Holmes crossed into his character in the WB series Supernatural, 
and his role as Inspector Gregson in the audible drama Moriarty, The Devil's Game. The Sherlock Holmes Review is back, combining great design with great writing, welcoming fans of every age and attitude. Get the latest issue, the 2022 annual, at wessexpress.com today. everyone's favorite Sherlockian quiz show. It's Canonical Couplet, where we give you two lines of poetry, and we ask you to identify which Sherlock Holmes story it is that we're talking about. Now, if you were around here the last time, you may recall that we gave you this clue. It's hard to find a workable deterrent for Kluxers, both historical and current. <laughs> Bert, mm. oh Bert, yeah. Do, <laughs> do you know which story we're talking about this yes, time around? Yes, of course, of course. The famous case, one of my favorites, the case where Violet Hunter, all alone in the world, comes to Sherlock Holmes. She's out of work, and she winds up doing. Laundry for a policeman. That's the case Watson called the copper's bleaches. <laughs> the copper's bleaches. That's a good one. That's yeah, a good thank, one. Thank you very much. I was surprised, quite frankly, that with the clue including uh, cluxers, hmm. you didn't have something chicken related in the. Uh... I chickened out. Yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. <clears throat> well, you know who did not chicken out? Could it be? Uh, it could be. It could be Eric Decker's. Well, Eric Decker's, Decker's, Decker's. Gosh, I don't know. Um, he comes to us with uh, uh, his rescue mission every episode. <laughs> he says it's the story of a hero in the French Revolution who wore scarlet clothing with the letter A sewn into the front and was later one of the guests of the board game Clue. It's the story Watson called Professor Plum with the dagger in the study. Oh, surely that can't be right. Don't it's more likely a study in Scarlet. <gasps> study in Scarlet. <laughs> well, guess what, Eric? Uh, you are going the way of Bert this week. Uh, come on along, Eric. It's episode, nice over here. Yeah. Yeah. No, what we were looking for is the five orange pips. And of course, the uh, the key clue there was Kluxers. Key clue Kluxers. That's, a, that's hard to say. Um, the Ku now, Klux Klan, of course, was featured in the Five Orange Pips. So uh, the good news is a number of other people were successful in submitting the Five Orange Pips. So we're going to go to the big prize wheel and give it a spin. Let's see where we come down here. And it looks like it lands on, oh, Lucky 13. How do you like that? And that looks like it goes to our friend, uh, Jared McNabb. Yay! Congratulations, Jared. We have a copy of Alistair Duncan's Close to Holmes coming your way. So that would be great. So Let's get things queued up for this episode where we have a copy of The Worlds of Sherlock Holmes, certainly a coveted book based on what you've heard. And uh, the winner will be chosen at random as always, and it's from people who can guess this clue. The fundamental tale wins hearty praise from all who overlook its Mormon phase. If you know the answer to this canonical couplet, put it in an email addressed to comment at IHearOfSherlock.com with canonical couplet in the subject line. If you are among all of the correct answers and we choose your name at random, you'll win. Good luck. All right. That will be highly coveted indeed. Hmm.
Oh, you know what that means, Bert. It means the orchestra is after you. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it is, of course, time for Sherlockian news. All the news that fits, we talk about. Uh, where should we kick this discussion off? Because we've got some juicy tidbits today. Oh, juicy tidbits. Well, um, I could start with something that is uh, just a quick mention here. Our old friend, Arye Dworkin, has published his second volume here, Sherlock Holmes and a Father's Time. And you will remember we spoke with Arye Dworkin on a previous IHO's episode, and his specialty here is all about Sherlock Holmes solving the challenges of fatherhood. And Sherlock Holmes in a Father's Time has come out, and it really is a wonderful book with art by Mike Weinreb. And if uh, you enjoyed as much as we did our prior conversation with Arya Dworkin about his work, you will enjoy this book. Yeah, that was on episode 263 that we spoke to Arya about Sherlock Holmes, A Father's Time, uh, and mm. his uh, previous book there as well. The, the pair of books together are uh, a delight. Mm. Well, uh, going from book to audio, this is uh, of particular interest. Uh, Goalhanger is the largest podcast creator in the UK. And you may have heard some of their shows like The Rest is History, The Rest is Football, The Rest is Money. Empire. They've got a new podcast that is an audio drama, and it's called Sherlock and Co. And it launched on October 10th. And basically, it's it's set up like a, a true crime podcast slash drama. And John Watson is our primary narrator. And you'll hear, I think, influences from the Sherlock BBC as kind of a modernization of the Sherlock Holmes stories, but they are following actual canonical adventures. We've got, of course, our very relatable John H. Watson, Army doctor, just returned from uh, Afghanistan, uh, injured in the war, and he's back in London. And, of course, he gets introduced to Sherlock Holmes, and off they go. And um, we hear some reminiscences of a study in Scarlet, and then the second episode gets us right into the illustrious client of all things, down the Splugan path. Uh, so you can check them out at uh, wherever you get podcasts. And I thought it might be interesting just to hear a little bit of a clip from the show. Hi, I'm Dr. John Watson. For the first time ever. I'm a consulting detective. Every single Sherlock Holmes story. Do you know what, mate? God help me. Will be retold. We believe there is a bomb on a tube train heading to Clapham Con. I know this. Yeah, sorry, I was um, speaking to the listeners. For goodness sake, hold this. Oh my God, just don't pull the pin. Why on earth would I pull the pin? The game is afoot, Watson. A new weekly podcast from Goalhanger. Sherlock and Co. Out now, wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe now or follow on your fave podcast app. I'll do that again. It's rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a lot of fun hearing hearing the unedited Watson as he struggles with being a first time podcaster. Hmm. Uh, we can feel that deeply in our souls. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's really wonderful. This yeah. sounds great. And uh, I think we will do our part to see if we can bring the creators here to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. It would be wonderful to get into a, a conversation with them about the creation of the show. Yeah. Well, also, that would be great. Also, in the news, nominations are open for the Susan Rice Mentorship Award. And this is something that we've covered um, regularly in uh, at the I Hear of Sherlock dot com website, which I'm sure all of our listeners are eagerly scanning. But every enthusiasm group community really needs a mentor, somebody who's welcoming and somebody who explains 
oh, I don't know, you could say, you know, the outlines or the activities or makes new people who have an interest feel comfortable and welcome. And that was the much missed Susan Rice. And this is an award that was announced, I think, in, in 2022. And between now and the end of October of 2023, nominations are open for the 2024 mentorship award. And what you must do, and we will have all of the information, we have all the information on the IHearOfSherlock.com website, and we'll have a link in the show notes. What you must do is complete an essay of 750 words or less about why you think you know, this person is particularly welcoming to Sherlockians, helping new people get involved and so on, because all of that defined Susan. So we, we recommend uh, our listeners, if anyone comes to mind, nominate them for the Susan Rice Mentorship Award. Lovely. Well, as long as we are talking about nominations and honors, it is doily an honors season. Uh, and now is the time to nominate your favorite recent works of fiction, poetry, performing art, visual art, scholarship, whatever you can think of related to Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. It's done by the ACD Society. They hold their annual Doylean Honors Awards during the BSI weekend. You can find the nomination forms on the ACD Society website. Uh, the deadline for nominations is November 15th. And uh, just tell the committee what fine Doylean creative and scholarly works from 2022 and 2023 are worthy of recognition at their third annual award ceremony. It'll be held at the Mysterious Bookshop in New York City on uh, January 11th, 2024, starting at 11.15 a.m. Mm. And coming up in November, we have some Scion Society meetings, including one that I'm particularly fond of, the Cornish Horrors of Providence, Rhode Island, and obviously of Northern Connecticut and Southern Massachusetts. But for any of our listeners who are in the New England area who would like to come to the November 4th meeting of the Cornish Horrors, just send me an email and I'll provide you with the invitation. It's at the Hope Club in Providence, Rhode Island, a wonderful old Victorian venue and we have David Houle as our annual Leon Sterndale invited address speaker who will be talking about the we'll, the whole evening is about the case of um, the creeping man. So we're going to have a lot of fun there. And if you're in the New England area and would like to come, just let me know. Excellent. Cornish horrors. I, I miss that group terribly. Those horrible people. Well, that's <laughs> that. um, although Tyke Niver. And uh, if you may recall, we interviewed Tyke and Teddy Niver here on I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Uh, they play William and Helen Gillette at Gillette Castle. We interviewed them back on episode 126. Uh, Tyke said in his early involvement with the Cornish Horrors, he had to be very careful about how he pronounced it when making reservations at restaurants. <laughs> horrors. Yes, horrors. <laughs> the corn is what? Horrors. Horrors. Horrible. Uh, horrible. Horrible. Um, and then finally, we have uh, something else for you to participate in online. Uh, Sherlock Holmes magazine has commissioned a poll, and it is uh, in the lead up to the 40th anniversary of Granada Television's Sherlock Holmes series, of course, starring Jeremy Brett. ITV first aired A Scandal in Bohemia on April 24th, 1984. And uh, that was the first of 41 adaptations. So now Sherlock Holmes magazine is asking you to choose your favorite episode. They're going to tally the results and share them in a future issue of the magazine that will be all about celebrating the 40th anniversary. So you can do that at SherlockHolmesMag.co.uk. We've got a poll up there. And if you're interested, we also spoke with the founder and editor of the Sherlock Holmes magazine, Adrian Brady, in episode 206. Hmm. Well, we'll close up the news bag here. I think that does it for the Sherlockian news. If you know of a piece of Sherlockian news that we ought to cover, please send it our way. 
and uh, we will include it in the next episode. Super. Yeah. Well, I, th- this was a long one, but it was worthwhile, Bert. Yes. Yes. This is our, our first three hour episode. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> For all of you Gilligan's Island fans, this is the episode you would listen to on your way to the deserted island. Yeah, this yeah, is uh, a three hour short tour. cruise. We'll be back in port just in a little, yeah. <laughs> just in a couple of seasons. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, until we are back next time, and we do have some wonderful interviews uh, lined up in our future episodes here for the remainder of season 17. Um, I remain the worldly Scott Monty. <laughs> and I'm just stuck in my own poor little community, Aww. you know, just just me and the local streets and the neighborhood urchins, which are a lot of fun, uh, you know, as they hurl croquet balls back and forth in the back garden. I'm Bert Wolder. <laughs> and together we say <laughs> the game's, game's afoot. afoot. <laughs> 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 the, the game's afoot. You know, I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I am neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck, and believe me to be, my dear fellow, very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes.